Uh, I should like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this special event. Uh, it is really a great opportunity for me to share my views as a neuroscientist on uh, various aspects of uh, art education and the importance of art education to share it with you, uh, with an audience uh, consisting of uh, artists or art educators. The major conclusion is already displayed on the screen. And I think this is a notion uh, or a conclusion you have already made in uh, your history as uh, teachers. But something new I can give you perhaps today is to provide a neurobiological basis of this conclusion, some mechanistical explanation why indeed the brain is wired in such a way that creativity, learning and memory are so massively influenced by our inner world. And our inner world is nothing else than our emotional and motivational state. The cerebral cortex, a part of the brain, is, uh, which is covering, I'm sorry, is a part of our brain that is responsible for the highest uh, nervous activities. The cerebral cortex is a three, four millimeter thick layer that is folded up massively because this is the only way how you can squeeze in about two square meters of cortex into the skull, the available space in the skull. And the area of the cerebral cortex is proportional to the cognitive uh, abilities of a brain. And this brain cortex performs all these highest cognitive uh, functions via a network of 100 billion neurons. Neurons are nerve cells. Each tissue in our body consists of cells, as you know, and the brain consists of nerve cells, or in other words, neurons. I'm trying uh, to use as few uh, uh, words, Latin words, as possible, but there are a couple which I just cannot avoid. So these highest cognitive functions include, for example, conscious, conscious perception, learning, and memory processes. This cortex is able to design and initiate and control our movements. But also, it is the cerebral cortex where our external informations, various sensory modalities, are coupled to various emotional and motivational aspects or attributes. And the cortex is where our original thoughts and creative new ideas are stemming from. The human cortex is the only piece of material in the whole material world which is able to be conscious of its own existence. The human brain is nothing else than the peak of the evolution of material, the most complex product of the evolution of material. And this cortex can position the self in the material world and in the network of other brains, which is nothing else than society. So all these incredibly interesting and complex functions of the brain are carried out by 100 billion neurons. How can such an amazing f uh, list of functions be connected to networks? Uh, the only way to perform such complex functions is to form very complex networks. Complexity means that each individual nerve cell or neuron has to connect to as many others as possible. And this is made possible by a very uh, extensive network of processes. This is a neuron, a nerve cell in the cerebral cortex. And as you can see, it has two kinds of processes. This shorter one, shorter processes, which are enlarged here, Perhaps you can see even from the back that these thick processes are covered by spine-like appendages or hair-like appendages. This type of process is called dendrites. And these dendrites serve as antennae because they are the targets of incoming information. They pick up information in the form of electrical impulses from other neurons. And each of these spine-like appendage. This is a, a photograph of one of these dendritic branches. As you can see on this micrograph, there are several uh, spines decorating this dendrite, and each of these spines is a target from uh, another process coming from another neuron. So 
only thing you need to do is count the number of spines and then you can tell how many other neurons send processes to this cell. And if you count this, you can count 15 to 20,000, which means that a single nerve cell in the cerebral cortex receives information in the form of electrical activities from 15 to 20,000 others. The other type of uh, process is called axon. This is much more profusely uh, branching and much more extensive. It is thinner. This part is enlarged here in a photograph. It is much thinner and it has bead-like uh, spherical enlargements. A lot of these beads, as you can see, are pearls. And each of these little beads or pearls are the sites where this process is passing on information to another neuron. So this type of processes, the dendrites, are picking up information. They serve as antennae, collecting information from 15 to 20,000 other neurons, whereas that process is passing it on. And if you count the number of these pearls along these processes, you can tell how many targets this cell has. And it can pass on the information to 40 to 60,000 others. So imagine the cerebral cortex consists of 100 billion neurons, each of which can receive impulses from 15 to 20,000 others and pass it on to 40 to 60,000 others. So there is a huge convergence and divergence in the network of cortical cells. And you can imagine that the processing ability or the capacity of storing information in such a complex structure is basically endless or unlimited. Now, this whole system is becoming even more complex and this capacity of storage is even more uh, huge and unimaginable if you consider that the sites of contact where information from this kind of process is passed on to another neuron's other process is not of constant strength. Now, these sites where information is passed on from one cell to another are called synapses. And this is the last Latin word I'm going to use today. So just try to remember that this structure you see here, unfortunately, this pointer is running out of uh, battery. So uh, this structure is a bead of one of these axonal processes. This is passing on the impulse. And this black one is a spine of the antenna. It is receiving the impulse. So that uh, is con called the synapse. The process of the propagating neuron that is passing on the impulse, and this is the process of the receiving neuron, the so-called dendritic spine, which is receiving the impulse. And that is called the synapse. So the strength, how the so-called presynaptic neuron can activate the postsynaptic neuron is not constant. It is dependent on use. So it is possible to strengthen these synapses just by simply using it extensively. And extensively using it means that they have to discharge the pre- and the postsynaptic cell absolutely synchronously in order to strengthen the synapse. So the condition to strengthening the synapses is that the pre- and the postsynaptic neuron has to fire with a two, three millisecond precision together. So that requires an incredible precision in synchronizing the electrical dis discharges of the neurons. And the strengthening of a synapse is the basic unit of memory. So this is why you should try and remember this, because the most important thing in the brain to print in information or burn in memory traces is that we have to strengthen synapses. And the key event in strengthening synapses is to synchronize the neurons that participate in memorizing something. So how can, and of course, a memory trace is not stored in one single synapse. One single synapse is perhaps the elementary unit of a mem memory trace. But even for the simplest kind of memory trace, you have to strengthen the synapses between millions and millions of neurons. 
a million neurons connected by potentiated strengths and synapses, that can already mean an engram, a minimal memory trace. So, not the, not the synapse between two neurons, but between many, many millions and millions of neurons that participate in a particular moment in memorizing something, they have to fire completely synchronously. Firing means that they give an electrical impulse that is propagated to other neurons. So that is the way how the neurons communicate with each other. So all those that participate in memorizing something in a particular moment, they have to be synchronized with a couple of millisecond precision. How can the brain ensure this? This is what we need inhibition for. There is also inhibition in the brain. There are neurons, not more than about 10% of them, that specialize for inhibition. 90% are the excitatory neurons which excite each other and the synapses of which have to be strengthened during memory. But you need inhibition to synchronize them. Uh, I'm showing this just for the purpose of uh, an ex aesthetic experience so that you see that neuroscience is not only complicated but also beautiful. <laughs> so uh, how can you synchronize with inhibition? These are just a couple of uh, excitatory neurons which we drew here. These are the cell bodies of these neurons, nicely aligned in one layer. Can you see this green laser from the back? because if, if not, just tell me and I change the battery. So these are the cell bodies of these uh, excited neurons and the processes, all the processes originate from these cell bodies. On this drawing, you can only see the dendritic processes which are collecting the information. So if you want to inhibit firing of these neurons, where do you put inhibition? You put inhibition on the cell bodies. And this is an inhibitory neuron and the process which it is using for inhibition is drawn in red. And as you can see, these processes are strangling, are wrapping around the cell bodies of these excitatory neurons as if they would strangle them. So how can you synchronize with inhibition? For this, I'll show you an animation. Just imagine that you are all swimming here in a big swimming pool and I'm an octopus with the task to synchronize everybody's breathing. Nothing is easy, easier than that. I have many arms, I just pull everybody underwater, and after a good one or two minutes, I release you simultaneously. <laughs> I guarantee that at least the first breath will be absolutely synchronous. <laughs> and if I repeat this periodically, or rhythmically, if you like, I can synchronize every single breath. Now this is how inhibition is doing the synchronization in the brain. These are the excitatory neurons which have to potentiate their connections with each other, but to be able to potentiate connections, they would have to fire simultaneously. But as you see, they are firing all over the place. There is absolutely no synchrony. But only until they get inhibition from the inhibitory cell, and when they are released from inhibition, they are silenced, now they are released from inhibition, then they fire absolutely nicely together. So this is the way how inhibition can synchronize the discharges of those cells that code something in a particular moment so that they can potentiate connections with each other. And inhibition is nothing else than moving the membrane potential away from the firing threshold. And this inhibitory cell is doing this for all the other cells, so their membrane potential starts to oscillate rhythmically. And this is what we call brain waves. These membrane potential oscillations are added up because they are synchronous, so you can even record it from a, with a scalp electrode. And these are called the brain waves. These brain waves serve the purpose of synchronization. And synchronization is the basis of printing in new memory traces. Now the problem is not solved because one inhibitory cell is able to control the firing of not more than 1,000, 2,000 excitatory neurons. But as I mentioned, even for the simplest memory trace, just memorizing this laser pointer would require millions and millions of neurons which have to fire together. 
This cannot be done by a sim single inhibitory cell. So how would the brain solve this problem? Imagine that there are many swimming pools. And in each of the swimming pools, there are a thousand men and an octopus, which is synchronizing the man in that particular swimming pool. But how can you ensure synchrony between all the swimming pools? And for that, you need a super octopus. <laughs> and this super octopus is standing above all the pools, and it is extending an arm into every single pool. But there, it is not interested in men. It is just simply synchronizing the octopuses in those particular pools. And this way, it is able to introduce or induce synchrony between all the pools. So do we have a super octopus in the brain? Of course we do, otherwise I wouldn't have used this example. And this is the super octopus in the brain, which is a pacemaker neuron. Not a single neuron, of course, several thousand neurons that form a nucleus, and this nucleus is not in the cerebral cortex. It is below the cerebral cortex, that's why we call it subcortical structure. An ancient, phylogenetically ancient subcortical structure. Phylogenetically ancient, I mean that cerebral cortex is only uh, typical of mammals, only occurs in, uh, uh, in mammals, whereas even reptiles have a brain stem, and these subcortical structures are in the forebrain or brain stem. And yet, in spite of being such an ancient nucleus, it is amazingly efficient in driving cortical synchrony. These pacemaker neurons, they send their axons, their processes, all over the cerebral cortex, and there, they are not interested in the excitatory neurons, but they selectively target the inhibitory cells. And they inhibit the inhibitory cells, which means they disinhibit the excitatory cells. But via this disinhibition, or inhibition of inhibition, they can synchronize the excitatory neurons all over the two square meter cerebral cortex. So this is how it operates. And we and others discovered that it is not only one subcortical center which operates in this way, but several others. Some use GABA as a neurotransmitter inhibitor. Some others use serotonin, which you probably know because it is implicated in depression. There are a number of very interesting common uh, properties of these subcortical centers that in the example I call, call them the so-called super octopus-like centers. One major common feature is that they consist of only a few thousand neurons, and yet they are able to influence very efficiently the entire cortical mantle containing billions of neurons. And the key to this amazing efficiency is the selective targeting of the inhibitory cells, which each of which controlled thousands of other excitatory neurons. Another and most interesting common feature of all these subcortical centers is that they carry information about motivation, emotions, and the autonomic state of the animal. And this is the point where this lecture links very strongly to this afternoon session where several speakers were talking about emotional and motivational implications or effects of art education, particularly music. And motivation and emotions as determined by thousands of years of human cultural heritage, together comprise our inner world. And it is our inner world which can profoundly influence the efficacy of learning and storage of memory traces, and also the efficacy of recall. Because in memory traces, it is the only task is not to imprint the memories, but also to put a handle on these memory traces so you can recall them when it is required for some kind of uh, thinking or creative activity. So it is this inner world which puts the handle 
on memory traces, so you can grab them. It is this inner word which puts a stamp on information packages when you store them in your brain, so that you just, when you need this information, you can tell your brain the uh, stamp number and then you can immediately recall. Or it serves like mortar covering bricks. And if you cover it with a thick layer of mortar, you realize that these bricks of knowledge don't have to be placed just side by side all the time, collecting information like some amateur scientists. But if you put mortar around these bricks, you realize immediately that you can then build a new wall from it. You can put them on top of each other. The thicker this mortar, the more it will stick to other bricks. Your associational capabilities will be widened. And the more personal this mortar, your inner world is, then you can assure that from knowledge that is available now to everybody, you will remember something else. You can generate a novel thought. Because if you cover this brick with your inner world's mortar, then it will be your personalized information memory trace, which can be used in a very unique personal way. So if you believed all of this, then we can all conclude this obvious two conclusions that the most important educational or self-educational task from the point of creativity is that we have to secure the time and the conditions for the brain to couple our inner world's impulses to information packages that we want to store from the external world during the learning process. These inner world impulses are carried by those subcortical pathways that we call super octopuses in the example. And these are the pathways that ensure via this inhibition sufficient synchrony for an efficient storage of memory traces. Without this synchrony and synchronous oscillation, there will be no memories. And the other, which is just as important, is that this inner world has to be enriched and developed continuously but in particular in childhood. This can be done by enhancing emotional richness, motivation, positive thinking, moral, and the better transfer of cultural heritage from generation to generation. How this comes into the picture, I'll come back to this later. However, we are living in the time of an explosion of information and communication technologies. And that is posing a huge problem to really uh, follow these suggestions. What are these problems? The demand and conditions to incorporate our inner world impulses are in danger because of this explosion of information and co communication technologies because there will be no time left for the association of these inner world impulses. Just imagine our children when they sit down to the computer to uh, navigate to search for something in Google. When at the time they sit down, they still remember what was the original purpose, what they want to learn. There is some kind of motivation to do it. And there is also an emotional kind of attribute to it. But after the first 10 minutes, they find something that seems a little more interesting. They deviate from the original path. And then there they find again something else and then deviate again. That's why they call it surfing on the internet. Because after an hour or two, you ask the kid, well, why did you sit down? He has absolutely no idea. So at the end of the day, he spent enormous amount of time with exploring a lot of new information, but because there was no emotional attribute to all those memory packages, they will only be superficially stored. And they will never be uh, retrievable for a creative uh, thinking. So this will give them a lot of experience of uh, unsuccessfulness and chronic stress. So this results in superficial information gathering and a decreased creativity. And also since emotions disappear during surfing, then there will be a gradual mental and emotional degradation or emptiness. The other consequence is the flood of information 
exerts an adaptational pressure on the human brain, like any environmental change in biology. You know that when uh, the environment changes for any biological uh, species or just uh, organ of a species, then uh, it will uh, adapt to the new uh, changed environment by natural selection, selecting those genetic variants that can adapt better to the new environment. And the larger the environmental change, the larger, the greater uh, evolutionary pressure we are talking about. Evolutionary or adaptational or selectional pressure. Information explosion is a change, a massive change of environment for the brain. Because the brain is our structure, the, our organ that is responsible for digesting this information and storing it and retrieving it. So this massive flood of information is an environmental change for the brain. And the brain has to adapt. There is no chance for biological adaptation because with a natural selection process that would take tens of thousands of years. There is no biological adaptation. We can only behaviorally adapt. And it is rarely successful. What we see the most is that people are trying to limit this information flood just by emigrating into the world of alcoholism and uh, drug abuse. Or they believe they can digest that much information, but they become unsuccessful, chronically stressed, and depression and anxiety are definitely coming. So that's my first conclusion there. And the other one is that passing on cultural heritage to the next generation is becoming poorer and poorer, not only in quality, but also in efficiency. How does this come about? Uh, I can tell you very uh, uh, easily understandable ex ex uh, example. The eel worm. These are very simple worms that some species are living in uh, warm springs. And uh, the temperature of this spring water can change quite rapidly when somewhere in deep, uh, uh, deep in the earth another uh, water stream will join into the stream that supports the uh, the water. And that can change the uh, water temperature by several uh, centigrades. And this is a massive environmental change for a simple organism like an eelworm. How does this react to it? It reacts by increasing the rate of mutations. When it is uh, forming generations after generations, the duplication of DNA will have several mistakes. That is mutation, and there will be a lot of, lot more incidence of mutation. The mutations are by chance mutation, but because they are much greater in number, there is a much greater chance that a new genetic version will, uh, will uh, appear that can much better adapt to the new environment. But because these mutations are by chance mutations, a side product of this is that you are going to end up with a lot of monsters, freaks of nature. For the brain, the environment is information. There's a massive, profound change in the information environment of the brain. That, again, is going to uh, result in a poor, faith, a, a much less faithful transfer of, uh, in this case, not genetic information, but behavioral information. To, from generations to generation, and this is also going to produce monsters or freaks <laughs> of nature in societal evolution, which I call, which I, I consider terrorism, religious sects, loneliness, and selfishness. The third uh, dangerous product of this information and communication technology explosion is, for example, the amazing efficiency of electrical communication by internet, for example, the Facebook and many others. Why is this carrying a lot of danger? Besides being extremely useful, and I'm not saying that we have to stop it, we cannot stop the development of science, but we have to learn how to live with it. So what are these dangers which we have to learn how to live with? It often replaces personal contacts. A child is running home because uh, from school because there he can use internet or Facebook to communicate with 100 other people. 
Now this is just a quantitative enhancement of communications, not a qualitative. It is replacing personal interactions and when you communicate personally, of course, you can use all your senses. You can even touch the person. You can look in the eye of the person and read his emotions. You can smell the pheromones of the other sex, which is, again, something important in personal communication. But even if you just hear the voice of the person, it's telling you a lot more about the emotional attributes than just simply reading what he's writing to you on the Facebook. There, the only way how you communicate emotions is this faces with smiley or the, the other one. So you have a, a two-graded emotional scale, replacing this amazingly finely graded and tuned emotional scale that you can personally communicate. So that is sensory deprivation. And because of this emotional uh, simplification of the scale, then again, this is leading to mental and emotional emptiness. For adults, it can be even worse because uh, now there are plenty of possibilities to work from home. Earn all your money from home, even do the shopping from home. You don't have to even step outside of your, of your house. But that results in social isolation. And human beings are social animals in a genetically determined fashion. It is not the uh, man who thought that let's live in, in societies smaller or bigger communities, it is genetically determined that human beings have to live in communities. And this kind of tendency results in social isolation with all of its terrible consequences, which include not only physical decline, but also cognitive decline and personality distortion. So, uh, what can we do against all this? It is useless to secure the need the requirement or the conditions for the involvement of the inner world to the formation of memory traces, if this inner world is poor, disbelieving, or lacks any credibility. So it is just as important to enrich and develop this inner world. How can you do that? Of course, by arts. The key, I believe, which can, in the more, most simple way, uh, enhance emotional uh, richness is cathartic experiences. And in middle school, grammar school, elementary school, kids should spend a lot more time with poetry, theater, music, if uh, instruments cannot be used, then choir, painting, ceramic, whatever. Just they have to actively participate, not only uh, try and understand arts, but also actively participate in arts, in the process of creation. Cathartic experiences, as I said, are the most important. It can be achieved also by teaching uh, natural sciences, like physics or biology. But for that, you really need amazingly charismatic teachers. Also for art education. It is, there is no point to increase the number of uh, music uh, lessons in school when the kids uh, only go in and laugh for an entire hour because their teacher is not sufficiently charismatic to really bind the uh, interest of the kids. So a lot is dependent also on the uh, personality of the teachers. And as I said, active participation in the creative process. Education in moral and ethics issues and, and positive thinking that again I think is important and the establishment and maintenance of small community, communities. For the uh, reasons I mentioned before, personality uh, uh, problems and uh, emotional development. And what combines the positive effects of, of uh, create, uh, participation in the process of creation and the establishment and maintenance of small communities is nothing else than choir singing. So what you are doing here uh, is, I think, uh, most wonderful and uh, it can be supported by various different lines of research stemming from neurobiology. And let me close with a quotation from Zoltan Kodai. The mission of music is a better understanding, revival and expansion of our inner world, what we were talking about in the entire talk today and where we reach the barriers of knowledge, 
music goes beyond the scope of these limits into another world which cannot be known, only presumed. So, by a creative mind that is fertilized by musical education, that is emotionally enriched, this person, even if he becomes a scientist with natural sciences, will be able to look behind the limits of those knowledge that can be achieved in that particular moment by experimental science. But once you can look behind, you can have very good ideas about the possible directions. And then you can even be guided by these experiences as a natural scientist. Thank you for your attention. I think um, uh, Professor Freund needs to leave quite soon, but uh, in case, and I think, uh, I assume he cannot join us uh, for the questions and answer sessions. So if any of you has uh, very important questions after this very extensive uh, lecture, which I enjoyed very, very much, uh, just please just place it to him. We have still a couple of minutes for these questions. Yes, please. Yes, shall we receive uh, the... I, I gave a copy already to uh, your assistants here. Ah, great. Then we so will upload we it on the website, yes. And we will upload also later on when we will have already had some money to prepare the video clips of the video recordings, also the whole lecture uh, of this evening. And you can ask questions in email. You can find my email in the internet very easily. Yes. Any other question? So thank you very much again. Thank you.